the goal is to encourage as many parents worldwide as possible to register their child. The larger the database, the better the information, and the greater chance for improved treatment and a cure. What we hope to do uh, from gathering all this data from the various centers uh, around this country uh, is to analyze that data um, and try to um, make some hypotheses about what factors are important in terms of their prognosis, which children uh, will tend to do better than others, and which children might have seizures. Regardless of the quantity and quality of data, it is only useful if it's made available. An HPE Internet website at Stanford provides a wealth of information for researchers and clinicians working at the various Carter centers. It also provides various links to resources and support groups. The geneticists of the Carter centers are exploring deep into the intricate cellular architecture of the brain. The primary goal of this research is to find the causes of HPE. They are finding that the cause may be genetic, but not always. Researchers believe that there are certain chemicals in the environment that can increase the risk of holoprosencephaly developing in the unborn child. Using blood samples, researchers can tell if the cause in a specific child was genetic. And so what we do in, in our laboratory when a family says that we want to try and find out what the causes of our child's holoprosencephaly, then what we ask is we ask to have a blood sample sent to the laboratory, a blood sample from the child, a blood sample from the mother, and a blood sample from the father. If the laboratory finds something on the genetic level, then we will be contacted by, our, by the clinical geneticist what, what these findings are. What I expect to happen is that we're going to discover uh, a significant number of genes which, when mutated, cause this disorder. And as a result of that, we're going to have better diagnoses. So that by studying HPE, we're actually going to be able to figure out how the brain works, how it grows, how it develops. And that's what's going to happen as a result of this initiative. It's, it, it's a very exciting thing. And at some point, we simply must know what the molecular and cellular mechanisms are that allow the brain to grow normally. Many times I've heard it from so many mothers where mothers told me, I thought I had done something wrong during the pregnancy. We painted the house and I wonder, was it that? Or I walked by a microwave and I wondered, was, was it that? Or I live in a neighborhood where five miles away is some nuclear energy plant. Does it have to do anything with that? And if then we do the molecular studies and we find something in the genetic material that parents frequently are just relieved to hear that there isn't anything that they did to make this happen. Other times families are relieved when they hear that this is new in the child, it's not present in, in either the father or the mother, and what that means is that if this family plans to have another child, then the risk of having another child with holoprosencephaly is very slim. She was 6 pounds, 9.6 .6 ounces, and she's up to herself. While researchers focus on cause and prevention, therapists center their efforts on day-to-day, hands-on clinical management of the disorder. An interdisciplinary staff works with patients and their parents. Their focus includes clinical management, cognitive testing, dietitian services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, orthotics, neuroimaging, and education. Children are typically seen by a physical therapist to help them be able to function in their environment. It may be as simple as being able to hold their head up so that they can see a variety of toys, interact with their family. We typically see patients with uh, some type of motor deficit that could be spasticity or muscle tightness or muscle weakness. And so as an orthodist, we fabricate uh, custom plastic braces typically to help pre-position the feet uh, for walking or provide some type of uh, device to help the child stand. Children with HPE have uh, several feeding problems. Uh, certainly they can be born with a cleft lip or palate. Uh, infants lots, lots of times have difficulty coordinating their suck, swallow, and breathe sequence. And as they get older, sometimes they develop problems with chewing and swallowing. The dietitian can uh, recommend the appropriate formula for the child and also recommend the appropriate feeding equipment. 
and the dietitian works with the social worker to help the family obtain funding for the needed formula and feeding equipment. We try to incorporate our children um, such as like chance, um, being able to use the different types of equipment um, or things that are new such as EMG equipment, um, eye gaze equipment, computer access or switches and this allows them to communicate with their parents. It allows them to communicate with their peers and so that they can play on a developmentally appropriate level with their um, peers. They may have very good cognitive skills but don't have the motor control to be able to communicate. The Carter Centers represents a unique partnership, a collaboration between families and the professionals who lead research for new treatments and ultimately a cure. For the centers to develop new treatment options and to conduct ever more targeted research, it is imperative that families play their part. It is critical that they register and contribute patient blood samples. But perhaps just as important is that they contribute to the overall spirit of hope that enlivens the family resource centers, the labs and clinics where such important work is being done. New treatments, better outcomes, a cure. Believe it and it will be. In the past, HPE was an experience of family endured alone, without direction, without emotional or medical support, without hope. It is still a difficult way, but there are guideposts now, people who understand and care, and most important, a growing dimension of hope. And families are finding that along the way, there are moments, even seasons, of unexpected happiness and joy. Chances help us to, to surround ourselves or realize the real priorities in life. I mean, this child is happy with the simplest things, and he, he just brings such absolute joy to our whole family, not just to Hal and I, but to his grandparents and my brothers and, and sister-in-laws and, and um, brother-in-laws, our whole extended family. I think he's had a, a wonderful effect on everyone to be so thankful for what you have. They need to be taken care of. They need to be loved, and there's a reason why they're here, and, and we don't know that reason right now, but they're going to be here until they fulfill that. It, it's hard, it's a rough road, but I think they're worth, you know, worth it just taking it one day at a time. Just by being, they bring so much to our world. The joy we have in our children is not because of what they can do. It's because of who they are. It's just because they are. Most of the time, it's, it's uh, you get to enjoy life and you get to have a fun family. And you might have to have wheelchairs, you might have to have therapists, but when you're around your child, it's really fun. Seth, Danny, Jessica, Chance. They are mysteries of flesh and spirit, half-told tales, unfinished poems. But that does not make their lives less significant or less noble or less deserving of our love. Sometimes these children are limited in what they can do. But the profound and immense value of their lives is not in what they do, but in who they are. And our lives are far richer for having them traveled with us along the way.